Well, tonight I am going to preach what I would have preached to you guys last week. I know we didn't have uh, services, so I wanted to be able to do that for you, and I really like this sermon, so I wanted to do that. So if you would, though, uh, this morning um, I preached in Bloomfield a different sermon because I had to write a, ser- a sermon for my c- current class at Nazarene Bible College. And uh, I had to give that sermon, and so I preached that this morning, knowing that I was going to have the opportunity tonight to preach this one for you guys. And if you go to the, the Facebook page, you'll be able to see that on there. Um, but it's one that, that God really used um, on some people down there in Bloomfield, and I think it'd be uh, good for you to listen to as well. But it just talks, says, just believe. It's a, a faith that brings forgiveness. The story of the woman who, who kind of broke into the party at the Pharisee's house that Jesus was at, and she wept as she was in the presence of Jesus. She uh, kissed his feet and poured perfume all over it. And he just, he, she, his big line that he tells her is, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. How many of us want the peace of Jesus Christ tonight? Amen? Like that's huge. And so if, if you need Jesus' peace, I want you to listen to that uh, sermon. It's on our Facebook page and you can, you can go check that out. But uh, tonight I will be in Romans chapter 2. And I want to start off by saying that God has made us in His image, right? He's made us in His image. So there is something deep within us, deep within our human condition, that uh, makes us kind of want to be good people, okay? Once we want to be good. We want to be good. We're trying to figure out how to be good. And to use the language of the Bible, we're trying to be righteous, um, to have righteousness or a rightness, and what we are, and that's what we're seeking. And, and so Paul tells us in chapter 1 of Romans how we can be righteous. We are declared and accepted righteous in the sight of God. And Paul even goes on to say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, right? This, that's the big one from Romans 1.16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the story of Jesus. It's the power of God. Jesus can save you from Satan's hold on you. Amen? I remember I said, I'm pretty excitable tonight, so I'm hoping you guys can, can give me some feedback through some good old amens, okay? okay? Now, it all comes down to one simple thing. One simple thing. Have you ever heard the phrase, it's not easy, but it's simple, right? It's not easy, but it's simple, okay? That's kind of what we're going with tonight. And that's talking about the relationship with Jesus Christ. And this week, Paul is going to talk to us about an enemy of righteousness, and that is religion, right? The enemy of righteousness, of rightness, is religion, okay? Now, what he's talking about is people who grew up in the church, I'm one of those, grew up in the church, learning the Bible, knowing right and wrong, and living basically good lives. But this is an enemy of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's still about what I do and not what he does, Right? It's, 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 if it's about what I earn and not the gift that he gives, it makes me the center and not him. I can't earn it. Amen? And so it, it cannot be about my performance. It has to be about his performance. Now, Paul, who's writing this, was the most religious of all when he was Saul, right? Uh, before he became Paul. And he says in Philippians chapter 3, Verse 6, he says, As for righteousness based on the law, I'm faultless. This is the words of Paul when he was talking about himself as a Pharisee when he was named Saul before Jesus got a hold of him. The man had religion, but he did not have a relationship with Jesus. He thought he was making himself righteous through his religion. He did not know that Jesus would make him righteous through a relationship. And so this is a possible enemy of the health and well-being of our church, of of really any church that's out there. Our biggest problems are not out there somewhere. Our biggest problems are right in here. Don't take offense to that because you're sitting in here right now, but that's the truth. The biggest problems are not people who don't know the Bible. The biggest problem is the people who think they know the Bible and they actually don't. Those are dangerous people, and they are religious people, and they don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so today we're going to deal with five religious traps. 
right? And the number one trap, religious trap, is information versus transformation, okay? Now, Romans chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, it says, All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law, and all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. So number one, right off the bat, he says, we have all sinned, okay? Now, true or false? Is that true? We have all sinned, amen? Okay, so now what happens is we tend to be way more aware of other people's sins and not our own. And we live in a day when it's really popular to confess other people's sins, to say what other people are doing wrong, and it becomes about their evil and not our evil. And a religious attitude sets in. Now, it's also saying that the more you know, the more you are responsible for. Parents, the more you teach your kids, the more you expect of them, right? Uh, the more they know how to turn off the lights, they know how to vacuum the floor, they know how to clean the toilet. As you're teaching them things, and I'm trying to teach my kid as fast as I can, like I'm ready for him to mow the yard, and he's, my wife won't let me, but that's all right. The more they know, the more they can do. And it's the same in our relationship with Jesus Christ. The more we know, the more we, we are responsible for. Now what that means is, is it's not just listening to Bible teaching, but we have to actually apply the Bible teaching, right? And what that does is it increases the judgment on us. It does not in any way benefit you to know the Word of God unless you use it. The Bible is not just to be heard. It's to be obeyed. And some people treat the Bible like they treat classes in high school, right? Like, how many of you still complain to this day that you had to go through Algebra 2 and it did nothing for you. <laughs> now, you're never going to use that information. We can't let the Bible be like that. But that's the way we treat it sometimes. I, why am I reading Leviticus? This is just silly. I promise you, God's got something in there for you. All right? So read the Bible. Use it. It's not just simply for information, but for transformation. It's not just things to learn, it's ways to live. It's very, very practical. So then the question is, if it's not just about hearing, but also doing the Word, what does it mean to be a doer of the Word of God? And this is the big issue. In Jesus' day, the religious leaders would come up to Him, and they're like, holy cow, there are 613 do's and don'ts in, the first five, in these five books. 613. Can you please just break this down for us? Can you give us like a tweet that's just 140 characters? Break it down so we can understand. And Jesus says, you know what? I will do just that. Jesus says, what you must do, love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Love God and then love people. Absolutely. Love your neighbor as yourself. And what Jesus is talking about what we need to get a hold of so desperately is that it is all about relationships. Relationships with God, relationships with each other and others out there. The reason why some people have broken relationships, difficult marriages, children that, that don't want to be around once they become adults is because they have a misperception of their relationship with God. God is far away, so I'm far away. God judges me, so I judge you. God punishes me, so I punish you. God is usually pretty angry at me, so I'm going to start off by being pretty angry with you. And religious people who have a misperception of God will then use and abuse people thinking that they are being godly. Because that's the only way they know God. And so they think that that's what they need to do to others. And they are wrongly thinking that they're treating people the way that God treats people. But, as we know, as we just sang... God loves you. He wants you to love Him, and He wants you to love them out there. God forgives you. So, He wants you to forgive them. God blesses you. So, He wants you to bless them. 
God is really patient with you. <laughs> so we have to be patient with them. I want you to know that it's not enough to just listen to Bible teaching. You need to be not only hearers of the word, but doers of the word, because it's not just for information so that you can argue with people. It's about transformation so that you can love those people. Number two, religious trap is covert versus overt. Okay, now covert um, means secretive and overt means out in the open. Okay, now Romans 2, 14 through 16, let's read that real quick. It says, indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. Their consciences also bearing witness and their thoughts sometimes accusing them and at other times even defending them. This will take place on the day when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. Now, everyone, every one of us in here, every, everybody in the world has within them a conscience. Amen? A conscience. Now, a conscience cannot save you, but it can help you. A conscience cannot get you into heaven, but it can keep you out of trouble sometimes. Everyone has a conscience. Now, what's really weird in our day is that there are people who will deny that there is a God. They will deny that God gives them or gives all of us universal laws. And then when they feel something is violated or something is wrong, their conscience appeals to a law that they deny even exists. Now, God also gave us the Bible. And he's saying that God will judge you. Paul is saying God will judge us. The more we know, the more we're responsible for. We will be judged by our conscience. Everyone has one. We're also going to be judged by what we have in the Word of God. Now, I've taught this before. We don't get to just not read it and say, Well, God, I didn't know about that. I did not read Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, so you can't hold me accountable for that. He gave it to us. Learn it. Know it. Read it. Now, I think our conscience is a gift from God. This is why you don't want to violate or break it, because you'll need it. How many of you, your conscience has actually kept you out of trouble at times, right? You're like, I would really like to do that. Better not, right? Like that's, that actually happens in this world. That's a good thing. Now, how many of us have went against our conscience at times? That looks really fun. I'm jumping in, right? Like I've been on both sides of that. I'm sure everyone in here has as well. And what he's saying is God gives us our conscience and we know that certain things are right and wrong. We know that internally. He also gives us the Bible. And, and the problem with religious people, they're very covert. They're secretive. They're not overt because the religious person, what they're doing, someone who doesn't have a relationship with Jesus, but they're religious, is they're always judging everybody else Overtly, They're judging them out in the public. And then they're trying to deal with their own sin in private, not letting anyone else know what's going on. I deal with your sins very publicly, but my stuff I deal with privately. And what happens in a religious, judgmental, self-righteous, legalistic culture is that it encourages people to be sneaky. Yeah. Like, if I could just, if no one knows about this, I'll be all right. And because... We tend to judge people. But if you step forward and say, I'm struggling this, people can kind of hammer you and say, oh, you shouldn't have been doing that, you big loser. We don't want to be that way, do we? Don't we want everyone in here to be saved and go to heaven? And in order for to do that, people have to be vulnerable and say, I'm struggling with this. We need an environment of grace that is overt, it's open. It's not covert. There's nothing sneaky going on. It encourages people to come clean before they get caught. Anybody ever been in a church service like that? Where like pastors preaching, songs are being sung, and all of a sudden a person is just all of a sudden at the altar, and then they, they testify about it. I did this on Saturday night, and I just need you all to know before God that I am sorry, and I'm asking for forgiveness, and praise God he's given it to me. We don't do that anymore. We like to pray in our seats to ourselves and not be open and vulnerable because 
It's not about just being vulnerable because that can be scary, but it is about making sure that we are a place where people can be open and deal with their problems together. Because if we just try to deal with it ourselves, by myself, my stuff, by myself, we don't create a culture where people can get the help that they need. Because we're the hands and feet of Jesus, amen? People need to be able to share. All right. Um, Trap number three, preaching versus practicing, okay? So let's read this, Romans 2, 17 through 23. Now if you, now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those in the dark, um, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking that law? Aren't you tired of Christian leaders falling? I know I am. But a religious spirit is about preaching things that you don't practice. It's amazing to me because it happens all the time. And I'm going to tell you as a, as a teacher, as a pastor, it's, it's a, this is a concerning verse because I need to check my own soul in this. There are three levels of judgment that God has made for the teacher. The conscience and the Bible, which everybody is going to be held accountable for. Their conscience and the Bible. And then for those of us who are teachers, pastors, leaders, we're held accountable for what we actually teach. The words that we say. Jesus' brother James says that not many should presume to be teachers because we are going to be judged more strictly. Now in this particular passage, he's talking about hypocrisy, right? What happens with religious people is they use the Bible as binoculars and not as a mirror, okay? Now, when I use... A, some have a Bible I can borrow. Is there a Bible there? I got a, okay, here we go. So, got my Bible. And um, when we use our Bible like binoculars and not a mirror. So I got my Bible up, and these are my binoculars. And I'm out looking at the world around me. I got my binoculars on. I can see far away, right? I can see way. I can see you guys. I can see you guys. Be scared. I can see you. Right? But it's far away from me. I can't see myself. I'm blind to myself if I'm just using the Bible to look at everybody else. Right? So I'm blind to myself, but I could see you all very clearly, right? Uh, ooh, that guy needs to get to Sunday school. Ooh, that one better be at the altar tonight. Now remember, we're not a very big crowd, so I'm not picking and choosing where I'm scanning, okay? So don't be offended. I can see all that stuff in you guys, right? I'm reading my Bible. I'm looking at all of you, but I can't see in myself. I can't see my own stuff. The Bible is not to be binoculars. The Bible is to be a mirror for me. Now, if I'm reading the Bible correctly and it's a mirror, ugh. oh my goodness. Now, if I had time, I would judge you guys. But I am, I've got way too much work to do on myself. You see, like if we, if we read the Bible correctly as a mirror and we look at it and it reflects back on us, we don't have time to worry about anybody else. <laughs> I've got some stuff to work on, right? Like that's, we've got to read this thing correctly. Now, there's this, a new Christian came up to me once, uh, Pastor RJ, I'm reading the Bible, and I am not, or it, it's just not working. I'm reading the Bible, it's not working. The more I read it, the worse I feel. <laughs> Bingo, you nailed it. That's what it's supposed to be, right? Now, the, the point is, you need Jesus. The Bible is not all about the awesome things you've done in your life. It's about the awful things that you have done in your life and how awesome Jesus is to cover that up, to wash it away, to make us white, 
before, G before God and stand righteous in his sight. Ultimately, a religious person who preaches but doesn't practice, it's law for you and grace for me. And we can't be like that. Trap number four, religious trap number four, rules versus relationships. Rules versus relationships. Now, Romans 2.24, just this one single verse here, it says, as it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. That's, that's a terrifying verse as Christians. You do not want God's name blasphemed among the people of Sheraton because of you. You are a witness for Jesus Christ. You represent Jesus Christ in this town or wherever you go. We do not want God's name blasphemed because of our actions. A legalistic kind of lifestyle really hurts relationships in the church. It hurts relationships and families. And it really repulses unbelievers. The people who need the Bible the most sometimes are the ones who bump into religious people who quote verses but are not helpful in any way, shape, or form. How many of you, before you became a Christian, you hated Christians because of that Christian? Lots of judgment, lots of rules, lots of punishment, condemnation. Guys, one thing we need to do with non-Christians so much better than we're doing right now and that's, that's, this is all Christians need to do this, is we need to connect with them before we try to correct them. Okay? If you're going to talk to somebody about things in their life, you need to make sure that you know, or that they, they know that you love them, and you're seeking out their best interest. But ultimately, if you don't know them, and you don't love them, they do not trust that you have their best interest at heart. They may just think that you're trying to control them or punish them, which causes them to then hate everything that you are saying, and it causes them to hate the God that you say you are speaking for. We've got to love so that they can love God and feel and experience God's love through us. Winning arguments is fine. I love winning arguments. It is like my favorite thing to do when I go home on holidays with my brother and sister. But winning arguments is not nearly as important as winning people. Amen? There's no problem with winning an argument, but you need to want to win people to Jesus Christ. And to win people to Jesus Christ, you have to have a relationship with them. If all you want to do is win an argument, all you need to do is make a point. And I'm here to tell you today, guys, there are way too many people trying to make points in this world. We have very few people trying to build relationships. Now, when you're dealing with religious people, they demand perfection and they do not encourage progress. Now, true or false, God's perfection or God's standard is perfection. Is that true or false? True, not a trick question. Jesus himself said, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Now, we can hear that in two ways. Number one, be perfect as your heavenly father. I need to become perfect. Man, I got to work harder. Or we hear it by saying, there ain't no way I'm going to be able to do that. If you come to the decision that you are not perfect, you've never been perfect, your wife says you're never going to be perfect, then you know what you need? A perfect Savior. Jesus to be perfect in your place. The perfect Jesus to come and meet you wherever you are. Right? So let's say perfection is, is over there against that wall. Right? We're all over here. Perfection is over there. And I'm standing here. Religious people will tell us, why aren't you over there yet? Why aren't you getting it right? You are just so not okay. And usually they use worse language than that. You did this, but you didn't do it right. You did this, but you didn't finish it. They're just, the religious people become very discouraging. Jesus comes along, and what he says is, I'm perfect. 
And now I'm going to walk with you in a relationship and we are going to make progress. And Jesus says this, I have a plan to make you perfect. Amen? This is why Jesus came down to the earth. And he didn't just send a bunch of angels down with commands to say, this is how it should be done. He came down himself to the earth. He's relational. And what Jesus does along the way, and I love this, God, God is so good. He celebrates with us as we make progress. Amen? Isn't that good? He celebrates with us. You took a step towards perfection. Good job. That's awesome. I'm your father. I love that. Lainey uh, took her first steps just like about two weeks ago, right? And I tell you, I was sitting in my office chair. She had her hand on the little glass uh, coffee table I have in there. And she's looking at me. I mean, she's looking right at me. She knows what she's about to do. That hand came off the glass. <laughs> and then she dropped, right? Did I yell at her for saying, you couldn't make it two more steps? No, I jumped up and I picked her up and I'm throwing her in the air and I'm so excited because she took a step. God does that with us. He wants to celebrate our steps, little baby steps. And he's still celebrating that with us. God the Father, when you take the first step, when you take all the next steps after that, he is excited and he wants his kids to do well. Oh, trap number five, last trap. Outward versus inward. Romans 5, 25, or sorry, 2, 25 through 29. Circumcision has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circ circumcised. So then, if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you, who even though you have the written code and circumcision, are a lawbreaker. A person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. Now we tend to think of these physical things, these outward things like circumcision or baptism or any other thing that we put as a constraint or a requirement on the relationship we have with Jesus Christ, we look at these outward things and not, phys or not spiritual things. We tend to think of these visible things and not invisible things. We tend to, to look at things as outward and not inward. And we do these things so that everyone will see it and then they will praise us. But put that last verse up for me again, Adam, would you? 29. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. We have no praise to earn from other people. Amen? Not a single drop. Outward is not bad. Baptism, not bad. Circumcision, not bad. But what really matters to God is inward. And so many times we are trying to change our outward Appearance. We're trying to change our outward actions. And all the while, God is just trying to change the inside. We need to worry about the inside. Now, to wrap up, we need to look at ourselves. What religious people are doing is using and abusing God's word. There are people that almost end up with, with things like PTSD when they hear a Bible verse because they've been abused by the Bible and by people who claim to follow the Bible. Which one of these traps do you tend to fall in? Adam, if you put, put those back up. Which one of these traps do you tend to fall into? We want to be about relationships and not rule following. Let Jesus not only stand in the gap for you, but let him stand in the gap for other people. And we can all encourage each other as we strive to move closer and closer to who God is calling us to be. Amen? We don't want to be a religious people. We want to be Christians, 
followers of Jesus Christ. And I need, I need to say we need to become better disciples of Jesus Christ. The disciple is one who is in lockstep with their master. We don't want to deviate away from Jesus Christ in any way, shape, or form. Would you stand with me? I want to ask you to think about, as we leave here tonight, again, which one of those might you be? Which one of those might you fit into? And if you find yourself realizing that that you have a religious spirit or a hypocritical nature um, or you're about the rules instead of a relationship, let Jesus change you from the inside out. Amen? Let's get it right. We don't need to get it wrong anymore. Let's get it right. So if that's you, I, I encourage you to come. We'll sit and pray as long as you need to. But I wanted to bring these to your mind. I want you to think about it this week.